shopping fetish. Uh, and here, is obesity a choice. a choice is what I want to watch. This is a tough question. And a lot of people seem to think about it something like this, where you have an obese button on the left and a not obese button on the right. And anyone who is currently obese is obese because they made a conscious decision to press the obese button. But I don't think that's how it works. I mean, where did he write this? In his offline chat? I need to buy clothes, bro. These clothes becoming washed and stretched. I want cool shirts. My upper body literally perfect for button up long sleeves. Yeah, I'm going to go to LA soon. I just wanted a house in my hometown that I can reliably come back to when I want. Bro, XQC and I were supposed to do a drip stream literally 700 years ago, okay? So if you're, come pick up your juicer, all right? We were supposed to do a shopping stream like 10 years ago. It was supposed to be last summer and then you said you hated him, so shut the f up. I hate your mom too, but I still f her sometimes. Oh my God, it's literally been a year. Look at this, look at this. Drip stream when? November 26, 2021. It was when you were explaining Afghanistan to him. Yeah, Ludwig was still on Twitch. Things were so different back then. The implication is that sometimes you f XQC. What of it? What of it? I know what the f implication is. What of it? All right, let's get back to the video. Uh, is obesity... Uh, is obesity... A choice? For starters, if you selected 100 people at random and gave them the option, my guess is that almost every one of them would press the not obese button. People know about the potential health risks and social stigma that can come with being obese, so virtually no one would consciously choose to be obese in this simplistic sense. And we got Maybe it looks something more like this, where you have this lifelong continuous series of choices to pick certain foods over others, like whether to order fried chicken or grilled chicken, regular Coke or Diet Coke, a small fries or a supersized fries, and certain behaviors over others, like whether to get up and exercise or stay on the couch. And over time, maybe it's the cumulative effect of these many individual choices that causes someone to become obese. I do think this is a bit closer to reality. However, even this analogy is still very incomplete. Consider this graph taken from a 1990 study where 24 subjects were overfed by 1,000 calories per day for 100 days, or just over three months. All the subjects were under 24-7 supervision by the research staff, so we can be confident they were actually following the protocol. Each one of these bars represents a single person, and the height of the bar represents how much weight they gained in response to the same 1,000 calorie surplus. This person, over here on the left, only gained an extra 10 pounds, while this person, over here on the right, gained an extra 30 pounds while eating the same 1,000 calories extra per day. This could be due to a number of factors, but a big one is genetic differences in metabolism. Looking at this later study from 2018, yep. we can see that just like there are large differences in weight gain, there are- Your resting metabolic rate, chat, which is of course incredibly important uh, uh, and can vary greatly as a consequence of your uh, sedentary lifestyle choices, but also as a consequence of your genetic predisposition, thyroid disorders, and numerous other factors, okay? I myself have very slow metabolism. There are also large differences in how many calories people burn at rest. Just sitting on the couch, doing nothing at all, this lucky person over here burns about 150 calories more than metabolic equations predict, and this person on the left would burn 250 calories less than metabolic equations predict. In other words, if none of these people exercised at all, this person would still burn about 400 calories more per day than this person. So, going back to the buttons, a small fries from McDonald's has about 200 calories, and a supersized fries has about 600 calories. All else being equal, that's a 400 calorie surplus if you choose to supersize. But this person also burns 400 calories more. So through no action of their own, they could choose to supersize every time, and their net caloric balance would be exactly the same as this other person who chooses the small fries. But this Me. only considers resting energy expenditure the number of calories you burn at rest. People also burn calories through exercise, the thermic effect. Does putting on muscle increase resting metabolic rate? Absolutely. The more lean muscle mass you have in your body, the higher your resting metabolic rate is because your body is a machine, okay?
Uh, I know that a lot of Miz kids are doing Camp Canute right now, so they're probably like, "You're, we're already hearing this. We heard this already from Canute, and he's more jacked than you." And that is true, but uh, uh, that is precisely uh, the point. Canute probably eats a load just to even keep his same level of muscle mass. Okay. The more lean muscle mass you have, the more uh, the higher your resting metabolic rate is. Why is that not true for more body fat? Because your your body fat is not you, you don't you're not feeding your fat in the same way that you're feeding your muscles. Act <laughs> of food and something called non-exercise activity thermogenesis or NEAT. And the NEAT component of metabolism can vary dramatically between individuals even more than resting energy expenditure. NEAT refers to the calories you burn from daily activities that aren't actual exercise. So stuff like fidgeting, tapping your feet, etc. And even though you can somewhat modify your NEAT levels by making an extra effort to move around a bit more throughout the day, NEAT is still largely subconsciously regulated in the brain and it's dynamic. So if you have a genetic predisposition for low NEAT, you aren't very hyperactive. The ironic part is that NEATs and EETs, you know, the Twitch chat, probably has low NEAT. And you don't fidget much. And let's say you tried to force yourself to fidget more. In many cases, your brain would simply find a way to lower NEAT someplace else. So NEAT is, to a significant degree, outside of your control. And it can differ enormously between individuals. This study from Levine and colleagues overfed participants by 1,000 calories per day for eight weeks and found that NEAT- By the way, the irony is that this entire video is just, he already described why obesity is not a choice. In the beginning, when he said, if you asked a thousand people to click on a button on whether or not they would want to be obese or not, they would just click on, no, I don't want to be obese. So, like, he ended the video right here, really. We could have just skipped the rest of it, but I'm just kidding. He's, this is great. Heat levels ranged from negative 98, they actually moved around less, to plus 692 calories per day. This means that while both of these subjects ate an extra thousand calories per day, this person quite literally fidgeted off about 700 of those extra thousand, while this person actually fidgeted less, meaning their body had to deal with all those extra 1,000 calories eaten, plus a little more. So clearly, anyone who's been genetically blessed with a high resting metabolic rate and high NEAT levels can choose to press the junk food button many more times and still maintain a lower body weight compared to someone who's not as metabolically gifted. And this matches with our everyday experience. We all know someone who can eat whatever they want and remain almost XQC. inexplicably thin. And we all know someone who's tried every diet book on the show, Me. yet remains overweight. Me. Most people would be quick to praise the thin person for their discipline. You guys who can just like eat whatever the fuck you want, okay? My, my metabolism is so goddamn slow, dude. I literally get fat from smelling food, okay? Critique the overweight person for simply lacking willpower and making the wrong choices, not realizing the many baseline genetic factors that could be making it very easy for the thin person to stay thin and making it very hard for the overweight person to lose any weight at all. But that's just metabolism. There's another big factor here, which is hunger. Research also shows that some people simply experience more hunger than others in Me! response to dieting. Some people feel like they're constantly fighting their body's urge to eat more, while others feel more normal hunger, where it's low after meals and picks up as it gets closer to mealtime. Just consider this hunger study from 2013, which looked at the difference between eating a high-fat meal and a low-fat meal. Now, it turns out both the high-fat meal and the low-fat meal were able to suppress hunger very well on average. However, when that average trend was split up into individual subjects, you suddenly see this huge disparity between individuals. Some people were still quite hungry after eating the meal, others felt very full. And since hunger is what naturally drives food intake for most people, we once again see that someone who still feels very hungry after a meal- It's so funny because harder... like, bro, you don't even do cardio, lol. What are you talking about? I literally just played basketball for two hours this morning. Why do you keep saying that? Bro, you don't even like cardio, lol. You'll never lose weight. Um, so far, first of all, I lost a hundred pounds in like a year and a half when I originally lost the weight. Secondly, I do do cardio. What the fuck? are you talking about? I just did cardio earlier this morning. If you're a 25 month subscriber. You already know that that's on my Instagram stories. And lastly, doing cardio is overcoming your metabolic differences. As he is explaining here, not having a sedentary lifestyle is going to help move the needle. 
But right now we're talking about your natural predisposition towards burning uh, uh, calories. Permanently online weight loss tips. Yeah, and uh, also I went from what, 285 to 255 uh, over the course of the past year. So while it's a lot slower, while my weight loss uh, and, and muscle recomp journey has been a lot slower this time around because I am 30 years old, it's been going quite well. Her time stopping compared to someone who feels full. So we've covered two genetic factors explaining why weight gain happens to some people more my goal easily is than others, even pounds. given the same food and exercise choices. But there are still so many other biological factors that can play a role, such as whether or not you take certain medications that can increase appetite and water retention. There are also neuroendocrine conditions that can impact weight gain through hormones and metabolism. Then there's pregnancy and menopause, which have hormonal and metabolic impacts, and physical disabilities, which makes burning calories through NEAT and exercise more challenging. Now, of course, all of this doesn't mean that calories in, calories out only works for some people. It is a simple fact that obesity results from eating more calories than you burn. And tightly controlled metabolic ward experiments repeatedly confirm that caloric intake is the driver of both fat loss and fat gain. That's so crazy. This means that anyone who no is way. obese got obese by eating in a sustained caloric surplus over time. It's just that avoiding that sustained surplus. But once again, remember, people that get obese are eating at a caloric surplus. But remember the original first, the, the first six minutes of this video. That caloric surplus uh, is whatever your resting metabolic rate is, i.e. what your body burns without doing anything every single day, right? Except, uh, and then some, like whatever, whatever goes above that, right? Except people's uh, resting metabolic rate differs greatly, okay? So remember that. It differs greatly. So some people are not becoming obese because they're like chomping on uh, a food with like bad eating habits or whatever. They're becoming obese because they genetically have a predisposition towards obesity. This is a caloric like Medea. Surplus is so much harder for some people than it is for others and for reasons that are beyond their choosing. And this is why I think it's incorrect to reduce. Also, our food is dog shit in America too, for the record. Like, our food is, is not good. It's just not good. It's not healthy. I'm sorry. This is the truth. It is full of fillers. Disgusting. It doesn't satisfy you. Um, it's awful. All of these factors down to a simple choice to be obese or not. Because if that were the case, why would obesity rates suddenly start trending up in the 1970s? Exactly. Do people just suddenly start choosing to be obese? Or is there yet another layer to this? Well, no. I don't think that the spike was due to more people choosing to be obese, but rather from the fact that high calorie foods became so much more readily available for cheaper prices, meaning more people had more access to delicious, highly processed, high calorie foods. And this leads us into the whole other side Americans had nothing left after the 70s. The only thing they had was delicious treats. Okay? No more house with a white picket fence. Okay? No more unions. No more labor power. All you got was treats. Okay? And that was the, that was the way to showcase or to truly experience the way that kings lived. Okay? By getting the delicious treats that are readily available. That's why I always talk about the jalapeno poppers, because it is an American cultural landmark. Out of this, which is the environmental factors. So entirely apart from the genetic and biological factors that we just went through. And of course, high fructose corn syrup uh, subsidies. Yes. Uh, commercialized production of high fructose corn syrup and the subsidies that the government got. And then the cycle of lobbying that put it into pretty much everything. So there's that too. There are also environmental factors that can impact your susceptibility to obesity. This includes stuff like the food environment, where apart from the spike in availability, we also see better, flashier marketing for high calorie foods that promote overconsumption and large portion sizes. There's also the fact that junk food tends to be cheaper, meaning it's more accessible for people of lower True. economic incomes. Then there are social factors, like the type of diet your family and friends eat, which can make it a lot harder, or in the case of dependents like children, virtually impossible to make so-called good choices. Then there are the lifestyle factors, like how much sleep you get, 
And while it may be tempting to tell people to just get more <coughs> sleep, that isn't always feasible depending on work and other responsibilities. In fact, yeah, sleep is a big part, uh, part of it too. found that night shift work was associated with a 23% higher risk of being overweight. And this 2019 meta-analysis found a dose-response relationship. But isn't it so much easier to just be a conservative, by the way? Uh, Jeff is wonderful, right? And he is uh, taking the necessary steps to describe all this boring yada yada scientific, right? Isn't it so much easier to just be conservative and turn around and just say, no, you're fat because you're a lazy f That's the reality. That's what it's like when you're f def like defending uh, empirical evidence or defending arguments against like someone who is just a reactionary f idiot. It's so much easier to just be like, nah, you're a fat f piece of sh because you're lazy. It's so much easier to just say that. And then in an effort to combat that kind of misinformation and that kind of idiocy, you have to turn around and be like, no, actually, obesity is an incredibly complex uh, medical phenomena that is a consequence of all of these different systemic reasons. And here are some studies to back up that point. It's like, yada, 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 shut the f*** up. You're, you're literally f boring. You're boring. You're so boring. And then, yeah, saying everybody's just a fat f*** because they're lazy is truly brave and courageous. Yeah. That's the problem. Especially at a time when, like, stupidity is rewarded. Especially on platforms where, like social media, whoever arrives at the, uh, the, the, you know, the quick quip faster is rewarded as, like, the correct one. Whoever is more confident about their statement is, is seen as, like, uh, the, the correct person. It is infinitely easier to be a reactionary idiot uh, reactionary spreader than one who tries to arrive at the truth. Between sleep duration and obesity risk, less sleep meant more risk of being obese, with seven to eight hours being the sweet spot on average. Then there are psychological factors like stress and depression. This 2010 meta-analysis of 14 studies found that stress was a risk factor for weight gain, and this other meta-analysis from the same year found that depression was predictive of obesity risk. So, coming back to the original question, is obesity a choice? Well, I think the answer is no, at least not in all cases, and certainly not in the simplistic sense. There's just too much of an influence from genetics and environment to shift the blame entirely on the individual for their circumstance. But that also doesn't mean that no one has any control over their health and their body weight. Clearly, if people want to lose weight, even if there are many factors working against them, such as low metabolic rate, high hunger, and so forth, it's still possible to lose weight if you sustain a caloric deficit over time. Yes. And I can link another video here explaining exactly how to do that, which goes beyond simply eating less calories and delves into behavioral modifications that most people will need to make to have long-term success. Ultimately though, I think the is obesity a choice question comes back to semantics. Perhaps what I mean by choice is slightly different from what you mean by choice, but I think that if you did want to argue that it is a choice in some sense, I think the best you could do is say that it's a complex series of choices intertwined with many other complex contributing factors. Ultimately, you can overcome all odds, okay? There is nothing on the planet stopping you from having a six pack. There are a million different factors that will try to stop you from having it, but those are only hurdles that you can overcome. And the same attitude exists for functionally everything that incels advocate for, okay? Incels love talking about how, uh, you know, they're, they're just impossible. It's impossible for them to, uh, it's impossible for them to get women or whatever, uh, because they're unattractive or whatever the, right? And that's not the case. That's just not the reality. And a lot of the, besides disabilities, no, even, come on, like, of course, you're, you're, you're basically regurgitating what I just said, okay? Even disabilities in that circumstance is still a, a hurdle that you can't overcome. It's just about how mountainous that journey is, all right? Yeah, I already mentioned uh, thyroid disorders and shit too on top of that. Like, I know. I know that. Same attitude for choosing to be a poor idea? No. But you have to understand that this, in and of itself, this, in and of itself, 
does not mean that like people are choosing to be fat. This does not mean that people are choosing to be obese. Okay. Because those factors, those hurdles, okay. Are sometimes almost impossible to overcome. Okay. Like thyroid diseases is a good example of this. All right. More importantly than anything else, though, is capitalism. That's why whenever we f talk about, um, that's why whenever we f talk about this, sh whenever we talk about like, uh, you know, obesity or being fat, uh, I always tell you like, no, go to the gym, go to the gym, no matter what, going to the gym will always make you happier. It'll always be better for you. I will never advocate against the gym. Fitness is f awesome. Okay. Fitness is great. It'll make you feel better straight up. There are no disadvantages and only advantages. Okay. Picking up weights and putting them down over and over again, doing it every single day, is only going to improve your life. One million percent. Having said that, however, of course, there are gigantic hurdles. One of the most important ones being capitalism. Capitalism is stopping you from being able to get seven to eight hours of sleep. Capitalism is stopping you from being able to eat adequately because, more, because healthy food options are oftentimes more expensive. Okay? Capitalism is the reason why the corn subsidy and the corn lobby and also all the horrifyingly bad foods uh like lobbying for the, the for the terribly terribly unhealthy food choices is super prominent and that's the only uh access that you have capitalism and marketing is the reason why you see uh incredibly unhealthy food options uh as uh, marketed to you at an early age making it normal for you to consume these gigantic sizes capitalism is the reason why you can supersize things where in Europe, for example, the, the sizing uh, in, in European countries is dramatically different and much smaller. Huh. Ultimately, they are all gigantic hurdles. They're very difficult to overcome, but you can overcome them. Okay, so at the individual level, there are things that you can always say. Or, or there are things that you can always do. It's just those hurdles will make it infinitely less likely for you, uh, you to be able to successfully achieve these results. So as people in the health and fitness space, I think we should make an effort to be more understanding of these factors and more compassionate toward people who are struggling rather than making assumptions about their choice. It literally is just for physical appearance. You can be healthy and confident in yourself without going to the gym. What? Are you insane? You absolutely can. But also, no, going to the gym does improve your mental health as well. What the f There is plenty of evidence for that as well. What? This is the most insane thing I've ever heard, dude. What are you talking about? When I talk about fitness, I'm talking about fitness dick in your mouth, okay? When I talk about fitness, I'm talking about uh, the, the mental stability that you get from working out, the, the structure that you add to your life. I'm talking about achieving goals that you set for yourself. There are so many things that, uh, that improve when you go to the gym, Okay and their characteristics and then instead of blaming them for their circumstance instead focus on pointing them in the right direction with good sustainable nutrition advice when they ask for it now i want to give a quick shout out to dr mike isratel for the button analogy i first heard that from him and i thought it was great and i'll also go ahead and link all the articles that i referenced in this video down below and before we go i want to thank skillshare for sponsoring this video skillshare is an online learning community the only like the thing is when you get yeah that was jeff nippard friend of the show uh, is obesity a choice? Science explained. Um, so I guess the only downside of, of 